And if you truly believe that you can do something that's revolutionary and game-changing, then you should not be surprised when most people don't get it. Yes, I'm Alan Jones, founder and CEO of Bambi. And so Alan, Bambi has been around for five years mm. and you've raised an incredible 33 million. Um, can you tell me how you, how you did this and how this journey has been? <laughs> yeah, I just walked up and I said, give me the money. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. You know, I think uh, the journey has been incredible and uh, difficult and challenging and gratifying and, you know, all of the things... All the things and more they tell you when you read the TechCrunch articles, right, of all these hyper-growth companies. Um, raising money has been by far one of the more challenging parts of operating a company at this scale. And not necessarily because our, our vision is small or our product value proposition is not clear and crisp or because our growth has not been exponential, but more so because anytime you care so deeply about anything, whether it be your art, your sportsmanship, or your company, for the, the dynamic of fundraising to be you go up to investors and you show them everything you truly believe in, only for most of them not to be able to see what you see, is almost just by its very nature a uh, almost cyclical defeating process. And so I think the psychological aspects have been crazy, but, um, but it's been fantastic and we're, we're, we're off to the moon. So, Alan, what advice would you give to entrepreneurs that are actually looking to go down a similar path to what you and Bambi have done? Oh, such a good question. So, I, um, th the truth is, like, th there's not a ton of advice. I've gotten a lot of advice over the years. Um, I've learned a couple of things. Um, I'll say some things I learned, and then I'll save, save my advice. One, I've learned that wisdom is experience that comes with time, right? And so, people with wisdom giving you, trying to share their wisdom with you is often mostly unhelpful. Um, unfortunately, you have to, you know, wisdom is just crystallized experiences. And as an entrepreneur, you've got to follow your gut and you've got to form your own experiences. And that is how you create wisdom. You're not going to get it, you know, spoon fed to you from some really smart guy who's made a lot of money. Um, so that's kind of one. So like, you know, follow your own path, follow your gut. That's, that's the first thing. The second, and I think the most important is if you truly believe that what you're building is special, and if you truly believe that you can do something that's revolutionary and game-changing, then you should not be surprised when most people don't get it. Otherwise, it would not be special. And I think that what happens is, as entrepreneurs, we go around and we shop our ideas to smart folks and investors, and we want them to validate um, our own ideas and instincts by just simply saying, yeah, I totally get it, it's great. Well, then it wouldn't be special. It would already be invented. And so when you see something that you think that other people don't see and you really think it's special, you have to ride that even when no one else sees it until everybody does. That's great advice, actually. And it's kind of uplifting for people who have something that they just are frustrated with trying to sell and get yeah. funding for. And I'm back to your 33 million, of course. <laughs> <laughs> how, how have you made that work for you in the past five years? And um, how has it been invested? And Yeah, um, I think the... A couple of fundamental principles of running, company, running companies and building businesses that I think about. One, we fundamentally think about the model first, right? We didn't build the company because we had a good idea. We looked at, at the market dynamics and we saw that, you know, of the 6 million companies, small businesses in America, 96% of them did not have HR help, did not have an HR manager. And all of them, you know, were asking questions on Google about how to answer really hairy, complex problems, right? And so we looked at the market dynamics and decided, look, we think that there's a business there, but a business is nothing without the fundamentals. And so we thought about pricing and marketing and positioning as a core part of our startup um, kind of zero to one exercise, not just building the product, right? And so very early on, we deployed that capital, or as they say, we put the capital to work, not just in product development, but in really honing our marketing message and really making sure that you know, everything you see on Bambi, when you go to Bambi.com, it says hire an HR manager for $99 a month. Well, we say that because we've tested it and we know that that's the most effective way at resolving the anxieties that small business owners have about what our company does. They, they, they're like, oh, I need an HR manager. They're like, $99, I can afford that, right? And so we are, the capital we put to work has been on product, on marketing infrastructure and sales strategies to make sure our model works. You know, we raise our Series B 
our first growth round um, in October of last year. And a, a lot of that has been spent on optimizing our marketing, growing tremendously fast. You know, we grew 300% in 2019 or 2020. I can't remember the years anymore after we missed that one COVID year. I don't really know what year it is. Um, and then, you know, we'll grow 2x this year as well. How has it changed since Bambi was founded five years ago? Has it, has it got much bigger and more competitive? Um, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? So, so I'll, I'll answer that in a few different ways. I think that there are, um, one, I'll talk about it from a geo-specific level. You know, in Los Angeles, um, San Francisco is where all the country's unicorns are. Um, Los Angeles has finally started to, on a reoccurring basis, um, produce a number of unicorns. Um, two of the, I know, I'm, I'm from there, so I'm cheering inside. Two of the unicorns in the last 12 months that just went public, one of them is a company called LegalZoom. Another one is a company called ZipRecruiter where I was the chief marketing officer for three years. Um, and so I think just the, the market and all of those, both those companies are in the HR sector, right? So in recent months and years, LA has seen a tremendous uh, level of increased enterprise value and public offerings from HR technology companies. So that's been good for the market. COVID has expedited, it's done two things. It's created clarity for business owners how much they need human resource help, HR tech. And it's created a di distributed model where people are willing to do things like hire an HR manager for $99 a month all online. I'd like to talk about the future of work. Hmm. And I think even especially for the tech sector in the last 18 months, the future of work has really become the present of work. Hmm. And what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that this kind of corporate setup we have where people are essentially still working from home a lot. You think this will continue post-COVID? Is, is it the new normal? Oh, I have so many things to say about this topic. So um, one, I think first we have to stop talking about this conversation as if it's a monolith. There are unequivocally some jobs that are probably, that are better done remote. And there are some jobs that are not, that are not as great done remotely. Not as good for the talent, performing the job function, not as good for the remote that needs to be done from the talent. And for some reason, we're in this weird space where most people want to believe that remote work as a monolith, as a singular way of working, is the way that we should be having this conversation. The truth is, if you are a young company like Bambi, growing 300% a year, and a lot of the, you know, the people on the team are fresh out of college, or it's their second job in technology, they don't actually know all the skills they need to perform the functions of the job. And they're not going to learn it at home inside of, their, inside of their home offices or living room, right? And so what is the outcome when the people on the team that you need to learn skills over time so the company can be successful can't learn those skills? Worse outcome for those people in those careers, worse outcome for the companies because those companies will not succeed. And so I think that what we'll see, hopefully, you know, there's like all this, there's a lot of fear mongering, right? The great resignation, everyone's quitting their jobs. All the employees have their power back. Well, all the power back is nothing if the job you're working at and working for doesn't, that, if that company's not going to succeed, right? I don't want all the power and no job, right? I want the right amount of power and the right amount, and, and, and a company that's going to thrive and help my career. So um, couple, to summarize this, yes, the future of work is going to change forever, but we as a population should and will start having this conversation through the lens of segments, Certain work that's really good to have to do remotely, certain work that's really good to do at home. Last comment um, is it, it is not just what is good for the employee, it is also what is good for the outcome of the business that we have to think about when we have this conversation about remote work. Um, and I hear a lot of arguments right now about why it's better for the employee but not a ton of arguments yet about why it's better for the business. In the last 18 months, obviously, companies like Zoom and all of their counterparts, they've got huge, they're doing lots of big business. That's mm. great. That space is thriving. And there have been benefits as well to people working remotely. But what do you think are the drawbacks to this? Are we losing something by seeing Zoom et al. as the solution? Yeah, I... So it's such a good question. You know, there are so many benefits working from home. Are you kidding me? I loved putting on my robe in the morning, walking my dog, coming back home, having a coffee, doing my first Zoom call with the camera off. It was delicious for a time. And then about four months in, I realized that it was not healthy. 
that like I should probably wake up a little bit earlier. I should probably change and shower even if I'm just going into my office. I should maybe wear work clothes because there were some psychological benefits to me being able to see that I was switching from work mode and switching to, to, to being at home. And that the, the, the segment of my day in life, I'm wired, I think we're wired to appreciate. It adds dividers to our time periods. It helps us hold memories so that everything, remember during COVID, everything seemed to string together. And then you couldn't remember which day you did a certain thing. It's because we didn't have chapters in our days. And I think chapters in our story, in the human story, are so important. Um, and so one of the benefits and some of the drawbacks are I think we lack chapters so that we can hold memories and create new experiences. I was reading a book by the authors of, a, um, of a Rework. I can't remember what it's called. It was right before COVID and it was about working from home. And in the book, they articulated tr commuting to work on the New York subway. And the, the memories they cited were like, oh, people stink. And they were, they were, they were praising working at home, right? And they were like, oh, the subway is crowded. And, they, and I was reading this story and I was like, man, what a pessimistic view of the world. You also get to like walk outside in the sunshine, look up at the New York skyline, get into a subway, hear someone playing the violin, listen, you know, get on, get on and see people working. Like there's a beauty in all of that as well. And I think that is something that is necessary to human joy and happiness. Um, and I think working from home robs us, on, robs us of that. And I feel like the message of that book was like, people, you. That's correct. <laughs> just... And I'm like, people, awesome. <laughs> yeah. You know, quite a, it's a different view. And I'm finally, I just want to ask you about Bambi itself. What, what do you think the, f the future holds for Bambi? Can you give us some of your plans or projections for the next five years? Yes. So we spent four years launching, um, launching our kind of core HR autopilot and HR manager service. That is the crux of our growth. Um, you know, we're adding 25,000 new companies to the platform every single year. Um, and so astronomical growth by really any measure. And that's because we've hit on this pain point that has left American small business owners kind of left alone for a long time. Um, we just recently launched our payroll product, which is the first payroll product that allows HR guidance um, in the country. So payroll products exist today in the market. Bambi's payroll product actually makes sure that our companies don't make mistakes, which is top three reasons why companies get sued in America is because they made a critical payroll error in, by accident, not even on purpose, just by accident. Um, and so our product helps to solve that gap. I think uh, over the next three years, we plan to take quite a few other categories on by storm. So we will launch benefits in 401k next year. Ultimately, we want to own the end-to-end -end employment experience. That's fantastic. That's beautiful. <laughs> a good vision. And thank you so much for your time, Alan. Thank you for all the questions today.